my next guest, Rebecca Taylor, uh, or Rebecca Taylor, sorry, Rebecca, got to tell you, this, this is one of the better conversations that I've had. Uh, she's such a genuine person and so knowledgeable. I mean, there's brilliance underneath what, what looks like a, you know, unassuming, just nice, a very, very nice, um, person. That's just a laser sharp in this real estate industry. Um, and, and in sales in general, just a, a brilliant mind and, and a great heart. And it was a pleasure talking with her. So I'm excited to share her story with the world. Let's, uh, let's dive in and hear it. Hey, Rebecca, welcome to the show. Thank you, Trevor. It's good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Awesome. Super excited to, um, to chat with you. I know you're in, I mean, you're, you're, you're doing real estate sales. You've worked in syndications a bit, but you're, you got a niche in um, assisted living. Um, so I can't really wait to hear about that, but if you don't mind starting off, like how did you get into real estate, um, in particular, and then let's segue to the story of how you got into assisted living. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my dad is a big investor out in Montana. So he started investing in real estate in 2004. My grandmother was a realtor. Um, so I've kind of like been born into it a little bit, not born into it, but been seeing it and hearing about it for a long time. And so my husband and I bought our first rental in 2012 and slowly kind of made our way into real estate. I had been spending, I spent 10 years in the tech world doing sales and marketing, making great money, but also getting really tired and burnt out. And as I started to realize, you know, as, as I had kids in 2016, I was like, man, my time is really valuable and I'm working myself to the bone. I'm getting tired and I'm not really seeing like, I'm seeing good money, but at the end of the day, like what am I really building for me and my family? And so, um, Back during COVID in 2020, my family and I decided to, I left my job in tech, um, just left it behind. And we took a three month sabbatical, traveled around the country with a camper in tow and our two kids and um, explored. And I had this chance to like dream again and figure out like, what do I want to do with my life? Here I am like 30, uh, three, if I forget how old I was then, but 34, you know, trying to figure out like, what does life look like? What is the meaning of life? And so um, I realized, man, real estate has been so good to my family and it's been good to us the little bit that we've done. I think I need to pursue this more. And so decided um, when we got back from that, I'm going to get my real, my real estate license. I'm going to start buying and selling homes for clients um, and also doing that more for ourselves. And so we had um, a bunch of equity in our home. We did a cash out refinance. We had a bunch of money just sitting in the accounts. We're like, let's use this. Let's go buy some more rental properties. And so that's what we did. Um, and then I stumbled into the passive investing space space with a private equity firm locally and came on board with them as their director of investor relations and started to learn the ins and outs of the passive side and bringing investors into deals. And so it's been, I've been at two different firms the last couple of years, started my own company in April. And I partner with best in class operators to get deals done. And so I love real estate. I, again, I do it actively and I do it passively. And I love sharing the benefits with people and being able to just get them into deals. And um, I just see so much, you know, that it is done for our family and uh, like providing more time and providing more um, just freedom. And so yeah. I'm excited to be able to tell other people about that. That's awesome. That It's really, I, Man, that's like, it's crazy. It resonates with me a lot because kind of the same thing happened to me when the pandemic first started. Um, it, I was in mortgages and initially in the mortgage space, actually a lot of deals died in that in March, right? Because people lost their job. So all of a sudden, you a lot of, like just because of that, a lot of deals died. So before like rates hit the floor, because no one really saw that coming, there was a really... Um, for like 30 days, this incredible slowdown. And I did the same thing. I hopped in a van. I got my family. We rented a van. It was super cheap. And we drove around for like a week. Um, just like, I got nothing to do. I got no mortgages to work on. Let's um, let's just go drive around. Let's go rent a van. And we, we ate out of the van because you like, couldn't go into stores or restaurants. Um, trying to figure out the meaning of life for a week. And then I came back to a, a mortgage storm. But, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of... Uh, kind of funny, you know, similar, similar along that respect. Um, so you're, that's really cool that you've, you kind of fell into the passive space, which I, I really love. Um, and you, and so you haven't really done any real estate sales work, maybe outside of friends and family, I take it. Uh, like, like as a realtor. Right. Um, you know, actually I, I was pretty, I was pursuing it pretty hard in 2021, 2022. This year has been a lot slower just cause I haven't been pushing it as hard. I have a closing on Monday, you know, I've done something. Those are not friends or family. It's like a referral, but, um, 
I, I just haven't pushed that side as hard because I honestly like the hours are really tough as a realtor and yeah. being with small kids at home, I was like, I don't know if this is life for me. I'm making great money. Don't get me wrong. Like I love the money that qu- it feels sometimes quick, not all the time. You have those challenging clients that might take six months or a year or not do anything at all, which is hard. But, um, I, I love I love sales. I've been in sales my whole, you know my whole career, and so I, being in that role is a lot of fun. But the hours are hard. I'd be up yeah. at midnight writing contracts, you know. Yeah. So I think that's kind of why I was like, man, there's got to be a different way to like tweak this. And as I started to explore real estate more, I was like, man, there's so many different options out there for how to make money. This is a really cool space, and I can figure out what really works for me and my family. Sure. All right. What What are the things? So, what are the things that um, that you've seen? Like, the, I mean, you you mentioned. I, I know that you talk. Uh, you're particularly interested in assisted living. So, what what led you to that? Yeah. So, um, I've invested personally. I mean, again, like actively here in our local area, single family home, small multifamily, and then I've gotten into passive investments, fund of funds. So, I've invested in like mobile home parks, self storage some light industrial, and then I've done some more multifamily syndications. And um, I've gotten to see like both sides of the coin when it comes to fund of funds versus singular assets. And um, there's a lot of pros and cons either way. But one of the challenges I've seen lately, uh, you know, as you know, the debt market has been really challenging and multifamily in general has just been harder to find good deals um, right. that really pencil out. I have been yeah. to a number of conferences this year. The resounding thing, I'm, a theme I'm hearing from people is, you know, I just can't find a good deal. Like it, mm-hmm. people are selling way too high. Interest rates are way too high. We just can't make any money. We're going to lose money on this deal. And people are, I mean, sadly, we're seeing foreclosures and all sorts of issues across the board. And so I, knowing that in the last few years, I think even just seeing how overheated multifamily was, I've been thinking for a while, like I need to look at other asset classes and assisted living is a little bit different flavor of multifamily. It's still a, I think it's still part of multifamily, but it's just a little different. And so as I started digging a little bit more, one of my friends in this space uh, had gotten, she found a group that she's partnered with and she introduced me to them. And I was just blown away by uh, just what they're doing and their experience, their um, experience both in multifamily and with assisted living, their team. Um, They really, they found this off market deal that's um, phenomenal. It's, we're getting it at a $2 million discount. You know, there's a lot of really great things about it. Um, it's, we were able to build a really solid relationship with the owner that's selling. And so, but outside of just the individual deal, this asset in general, this space in general, there's a huge need for it. I mean, it's like this population is going to like double by, I think it's 2060, this elderly population. And, Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have all the stats pulled up in front of me, but there's just going to be a huge, huge, huge need for these types of facilities and there's not enough out there. And so I think that we're kind of like on the cusp of, of needing more housing for these people and be able to meet that um, demand. You know, there, not only is it going to provide some really awesome returns financially, I think we're going to see some really fantastic returns at like uh, a personal level. I, I mean, I love the fact that we're providing housing for these people in a really important time of their lives. You know, they yeah. are, they, they need care, but they also need community. They need a really good place to spend these latter years, you know, and I don't want to get to the end of my life and be a burden to maybe family. If I need help, I want to be in a, a, a good place that I feel comfortable. I feel cared for. I enjoy it. I'm, I'm not like hating my life, you know, and I think sadly some people in these years do. Um, And so I just I love the fact that we're providing something that's a little bit different outside of just the housing, which is still super important. Um, It's it's really meeting a need and we're having impact on people's lives. Sure. No, that's uh, and you raised some good points, you know, like the the economic opportunity and the the ability to kind of also, you know, provide something that lets people in in that point in their life, like keep their dignity, you know, and be respected. Yeah. You know, I've. like really incredible. I mean, but back to the economics and the financial side, I'm not going to get into the weeds and talk about the numbers on this deal. But in general, I'm seeing such stronger cash flow right out of the gates that I'm seeing on. I mean, some of the multifamily deals I've invested passively in, I mean, we're getting like 2%, 3% cash flow, if yeah, that. So yeah. just it paused altogether, which sucks, you know, like it, it's unfortunate, but the, those cash, the cash flow is just super minimal across the board. I mean, occasionally you'll see something a little higher, but I would question the validity of it. And whereas right. assisted living, I mean, we're seeing some really strong cash flow. We're seeing 
sometimes double your money in a certain time. Frame. I mean, I, again, I'm not going to get into the deals of the specific, specifics of that, but the returns to me are just a lot more stellar than what I'm seeing in some other asset classes that are just really hard to break in. You know, there's too expensive. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, with multifamily, it's all about the exit for the mo most of the time, right? Like this low yeah. interest rate season we experienced, there was cash flow opportunities there, but I feel like that's the exception versus the rule. Usually it's like a value add thing. Get in there, remodel it. Re you know, once you got the whole place remodeled and the rents are all up, now you can sell it at a higher cap or the same cap you bought it for, but a higher absolute price. And then finally, once all the value that's possible could be added, then an insurance company buys it. So they have something stable, right? Like it's just, that's all it's, you, you know, all the money is always made on the exit. Um, and you know, these cash flow intensive or like these cash flow plays that don't really have an exit in mind um, are now coming to the forefront, you know? So I'm, I'm keenly interested in, in this assisted living space. And I'd like to pick your brain for a minute. Have you seen it all on single single family, um, you know, large single family homes operated as assisted living spaces. Is that, is that even a thing? Yeah. Actually, it's so funny. I'm involved in a local, like what we call RIA, Real Estate Investor Association group. We meet every Friday morning at Panera. And so um, one of my friends in that group, he actually operates uh, a small, I think they have five beds, five or six beds. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's an old house and it's a beautiful house and they rent out the rooms and, um, but they still provide the care. I mean, they, sure. they make the meals every day. They have a staff of very small staff, but they do all of it, you know, and, and it's gone really well for them. They've made really good money. It is very labor intensive, obviously at that small scale, because, um, it, it often falls on the owners of the property to do a lot of the work, you know, versus mm -hmm. like, the higher level of like, let's grow. And they do some other things too. They're involved that they actually have some Airbnbs like you. Um, and that's really where they're, they're kind of moving their focus more to that versus the assisted living side. But, but yes, I've gotten to pick his brain a little bit and hear about his experience. And um, it's, it's interesting. He's made, again, he's made some good money in the space and they've been able to bring in some great residents and the staffing can be challenging at times, but I think they've got pretty solid staff there. That's cool. I might have to ask you to intro me to that person because I'm really, <laughs> I, ha I have some properties that just seems like a good idea, but until I know someone that's done it, it's like, it's hard to take the leap and yes. convert from something you know to something you don't, you know? Don't. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm happy to intro you to him. He's a great guy and has a lot of really good experience and feedback. I'm sure he'd be helpful. Awesome. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll uh, talk about that, uh, you know, after the show, but um, back to, back to you and what you're doing. Um, so you're, you've started your own business, right? Mm -hmm. you, you took the big leap and not just like real estate sales, but like, a, um, you know, syndications. So are you, are you, you said you look for great operators. So are you employing the fund of fund model? Like how does your overall approach to business, um, business look? Yeah. So as of right now, my, my goal is, is just due diligence and vetting these operators and finding the best in class. And we're right now focused on singular deals, not to say that I wouldn't go the fund to fund route. I actually have a lady in my mastermind that we've talked to. She's working on a fund to fund and we talked about potentially working together on that in the future. That may happen. Um, but my, my focus really is on serving my investors well and providing them with some options. Now, I don't want to overwhelm myself with too many deals or too many operators that I'm partnering with to where I don't have a lot of oversight in, in terms of what is happening on the ground with each, you know, the deals that I'm doing. So I don't intend to do a crazy number of deals. I want to offer a few select um, opportunities. And again, partners that I work with long term. I'm not just looking for a one and done partner. It's a this is a long term partnership that we um, we get to help each other, you know. Yeah. And I get to continue to work with them on the investor relations front. That's my background. The sales and marketing I, I help with as well. And so that's kind of my strategy is finding those best in class operators, bringing deals to my investors, saving them time and effort because most of the folks that I'm working with, they have jobs, you know, they love their, they like their jobs. They are maybe trying to bring in some extra income to supplement their, their schedule, their work. So maybe they can cut back at work eventually. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of my goal at tailored investments is to, uh, provide them with a really great investment opportunity. One thing actually that we started into recently is lending. And um, we found some really awesome, uh, an awesome flipper here in town. And so um, I've been getting to know them and, and actually talking to some other flippers and lending money, you know, because yeah. it's been a great way to like 
place my money for six months and make a pretty solid return um, when I don't, if I don't have a deal in play that I'm ready to put my money to work in. And then obviously it's held up a little bit longer in those passive investments. So the lending, the debt market has been a good place for investors that might want a shorter term hold and they still want a pretty good return. You know, it could be like 10, 12, 15%, um, just depends on the deal. Do you do now with those, that's so many strings I can pull on, uh, but with the, with those flip, with those flippers, right? Are you vetting each deal yourself and then going and find the money and making essentially a single asset debt fund? Or do you, are you kind of pooling? Like you have a, you'll have a few, um, but you get the money first and then lend it out. Like, how is that? How's that looking for you? Uh, so I'm, I'm right at the beginning of that. So personally, my husband and I have done just recently placed some money last month with uh, somebody locally and on one of her deals. And we, we did a lot of vetting of her, rode around with her, looked at her properties, looked at her track record. I mean, it's been like an ongoing process. And so we placed some money with her. Um, and I think we'll continue to, and uh, you know, should things go well, I just, before this call had another meeting with, um, a realtor in town that has a guy that he's working with, that's going to do a flip. And so I got a bunch of feedback from him. He made the intro. Now I'm going to go meet with the guy, you know, next week, hopefully, and, and, and go through my vetting process and then bring in some investors from there. But no, I haven't, I have not set up in terms of how I would do that. I've thought about the fun model in terms of having, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I, I need to think a little bit more about that. I'm not looking to be a big debt <laughs> right. broker or anything. I just want to have a solution for my investors that maybe have 25 grand or 50 grand and they're trying to figure out what to do with it right now. And I don't have maybe a deal to place them into, or maybe it's a 506C, they're not accredited, um, but I could put them into something that you know, I'm just trying to find some solutions. So honestly, yeah, I'm sure. Big at this. I'm early on on that front, but I see a lot of opportunity and I'm in some different masterminds. And that's a common theme I'm hearing is like, debt is a good place to place your money. Like there, people need money. So if you yeah. have some money sitting on the sidelines, why not loan it out and make 12% plus a point or two, whatever. You exactly. know, rates are high. Yeah. 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 When rates are high, it's good to be the bank, right? Exactly. The actual exactly. lender. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. So if I was to kind of like sketch this out as simply as possible on a whiteboard, you find a, an operator, let's say someone that's incredible at um, or has a really good track record of setting up assisted living facilities and operating them, right? And then you go get money for that deal to help that operator out, right? You pull money and then and, and as you're doing that, are you creating your own entity that um, you know, brings in that money and manage essentially creates the statements, manage your, your the investor relations for your own, your own entity, or are you becoming a partner, like a general partner with that operator? So I'm becoming a, a general partner, a co GP in the deal um, with them. But again, I'm still involved. I mean, I, it's yeah. not a hands off, like here's my investors and go take them. It's like, I'm involved in asset management calls. I'm involved in sure. communications with my investors. I need to know everything that's happening so that I can be communicating and giving regular updates to my investors, overseeing those distributions, the K make sure the K ones are sent out all of the different components. You know, I'm highly involved in that. So I'm definitely not looking for partners where they're just like, go raise some money for me. That is not my strategy at all. My strategy is to be highly involved in those, those partnerships. And again, it's a, a lot of due diligence when I'm vetting these operators. I don't, I'm not just going to go work with anybody. <laughs> yeah, sure. You're, you're the one that's looking at their, their track record. Like, let me see the actual bank statements where the money went in and out, all of that, saving your investors a ton of time and effort because yeah. it's easy. It's as easy or as nice as those, these returns can be outside of the stock market, like compared to the stock market, they're so much better. They're secured by real things that you can touch that you can live in. Right. Um, you know, so as much better as it can be than the stock market, it could also be significantly worse because it could, how do it could you be worse. it could be way worse, too. Yeah. If you don't. Yeah, do I mean, work. it's really it's it's unfortunate. I'm, I'm hearing again part of being a part of mass, some different masterminds and very involved in this space. It's we're all connected. I mean, it, as you know, we're hearing of foreclosures and investors losing, you know, all their money. All of, <laughs> yeah. 
capital calls. I mean, and I, I not to be like a downer by any means, but I think you just have to be so cautious and you have to do your due diligence. I mean, it's Absolutely. just, you've got to partner with the right people. You can't just trust them because you like them or you personally like know them from this person. You know, you, there's just a lot more that I think needs to go into that process of who you work with. And they need someone with. like you, right? Because at the end of the day, most invest, like, you know, when you look at, um, hedge funds. It's like, hey, I got this black box that I can't tell you about. You want to give me some money and put it in there? And it's like, Mark Cuban did. Oh, cool. I'm in. Right? Like that's it. It's like, it literally is how you, most people are making that decision based on how they feel. And they need someone like you that doesn't have the feelings. I mean, I can see that you're a very caring person, but like can go in without the feelings and do the due diligence. And then so that the people that trust you, right. And do make those decisions based on trust. Like they, they have you there to, to do all that work. So it's such an important role that you play, right? Going in and vetting the investment so that, you know, those, those people that just inherently make the trust-based decision, they're so, they're fortunate to have you. That's what I'm saying. Like your investors, they're like, they, they need you. You are needed in this world and I'm glad you're here and I'm glad I got to talk to you today. So thank you so much. If, thank you. if someone wants to, the way you do investments is, you know, just for anyone listening to this, because we didn't really touch on it, just broad strokes. There's two ways to invest with someone like you. You could either just have a lot of money and you're a shoe in or you could have enough money to invest, but you don't technically meet the definition of an accredited investor. And to do that, they have to get to know you, right? To invest with you, there's, a, there's like the general rule is that there's a period of time where you have to build a substantive pre-existing relationship before you can place their money for them. So if someone wants to start doing that, um, and how do they do that? How do they get in touch with you? How do they get to know you? Where's the best place for them to go? Yeah, so um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, and my name is spelled Rebecca, R-E-B-E-K-A-H, Taylor, and I think there's an 86 on the end on, on uh, LinkedIn, so I can, keep that in mind. I got a computer. Hold on. Let me look real quick. <laughs> yeah, pull me up. <laughs> it's Rebecca uh, Taylor, I, MBA. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's me. That's me. <laughs> okay. Um, but that would be, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn and then let's schedule some time to get on the phone. Like I have a Calendly, there should be a Calendly link on there on my LinkedIn profile. So schedule some time. Let's hop on the phone and just talk. I, I'd love to hear, you know, financial investment goals. And if it's not me that you invest with, let me just send you in the right direction because I do know a lot of people in this space. I'm very connected and I love connecting and helping other people. So you may not be interested in assisted living or debt or whatever, you know, that I'm doing, but there's other people that might be doing what you want to do. Exactly. So, I'm happy to just point you in the right direction and um, be a resource. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, Rebecca, thanks so much for coming on this show and, and sharing your knowledge and insights. Um, I appreciate it very much. And I hope we get to do this again sometime. Yeah. Thank you for your time. It's nice to, to chat.